The College of Complexes commences to begin. Though so we began back in 1951, uh, we are continuing tonight. Uh, and we have with us uh, our speaker, Jack. Uh, uh, Very good. Uh, and, and family. Jean-Luc. Jean they know their presidents, too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> of the U.S. Anyway, I don't know that they know. Yeah. Our speaker, Jack Chardier. Hey, Jack oh, I have to out first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I didn't know I didn't say again. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you guys today? Miserable. Uh, miserable. All right. At least you're telling the truth. Uh, let me begin by saying thank you for inviting the Fair Coalition, Fair Allocation and Runways here tonight. And I appreciate the invitation uh, to speak. I have to tell you of all the places that uh, we have been able to speak, and I say we, because we are a very, very large organization, although I'm here tonight, many people could be here for fair. Uh, this has got to be the liveliest, most entertaining uh, meeting I have been at, and that's pretty cool. Uh, and thank you very much for the record, since we're on camera, for the, uh, the dinner, too. That was very nice, an invitation to come a little bit early and get a chance to meet some of you, and I hope to do that also afterwards. Before I get into the presentation, I want to just acknowledge what I think is a great title for the day and age in which we live for the College of Complexes, uh, the playground for people who think. And uh, I think uh, it's never an underestimation to say that in a democracy, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we are very thoughtful about how we act, whether that's electing uh, our politicians who wield power in government and therefore can make decisions that have tremendous impact with us, how we choose to act in community with one another, how we choose to build our financial institutions, our social institutions, uh, and all the things that kind of go in play. And we have the ability to think through those, and so I just want to recognize you as members of the College of Complexes for uh, being just up front and saying, let's think before we act. And I want to recognize you for that, because that, that's a pretty powerful concept. <laughs> Okay, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and get going. I understand that you have some handouts in front of you. Um, I'll reference those a little bit throughout the time that I talk, uh, but I will not obviously go through everything that's on there. I know there's a Q&A and back and forth, so if there's anything on there that I don't mention when I speak, please go ahead and just uh, ask me at that time. Okay, the FAIR Coalition, FAIR Allocation and Runways Coalition was founded in May of 2013, May of 2013, we actually started uh, meeting earlier that year in about March of 2013. Our goal, so I, I always lead off right up front with kind of where we're headed, right? Our goal is to get an equitable distribution of airplane traffic at O'Hare Airport, east, west, north, south, day and night. It's very, very simple. We'll go into why that is not the case right now. Our purpose is to get a real seat at the table on how decisions are made about O'Hare. Now, why would we want a real seat at the table? O'Hare is an economic engine for our region. We know that. We get that. Um, and so the reality is that a lot of decisions are made where a lot of money is gathered, right? We know that in our society. And so in a democracy, then, the people, we the people, get to be part of that decision-making process. And when we are excluded from that decision-making process, that means things are going to go awry as they have at O'Hare in terms of how decisions have been made that have impacted the quality of life of tens of thousands of citizens around O'Hare in both the city and suburbs. So what is FAIR? What is FAIR? Well, my background involves over 20 years of doing what I call building community building community, which means finding solutions together to the shared challenges we have that we face in our neighborhoods. Those are very simple things like zoning, new stop signs, new playgrounds, schools, 
kind of the very, the very uh, basic things we find in neighborhoods, to more complex challenges we face, uh, like dealing with massive increases in planes, noise, noise and pollution that uh, affect our neighborhoods when you live uh, in, in the area of an airport. FAIR is a citizen-led initiative. It's a really, really important starting point. We are gathered together as citizens, right? We're not funded by unions, we're not funded by businesses, we're not funded by the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, by the aviation uh, world. We are citizens who gather together freely and democratically to exercise our right to have our voices heard and to work to be part of solutions for things that are impacting our neighborhood. So citizen-led, democratic in nature, which is how we function, right? We have no legal structure, we don't need to have legal structure, we do have a leadership structure. But we're democratic in nature. As I said, we are citizens and civics. The building blocks of our U.S. democracy are you as citizens and then our civic institutions. The building blocks are not businesses, it is not unions, it is not schools, right? It's not those kind of things that we think of as institutions. It is the civic structures of our democratic life in America. We have now just crossed the 1600 member mark which makes us the largest civic movement on Chicago's northwest side and in the near northwest suburbs. There's no larger organized movement right now. We have 26 civic organizations that have signed our letter. We have a fair allocation runways letter that you can sign, and 21 elected officials. We are both city and suburbs, and the interesting thing is that we are actually stronger in the suburbs in the sense of the civics and the political establishment, if you will, uh, than we are in the city. So that is fair by background when we started our goal, again, an equitable distribution of airplane traffic, east, west, north, south, day and night, uh, and our purpose is to get a real seat at the table. Okay, so uh, what does fair want? What do we as this gathering of citizens want? And for that, I'll reference you to our policy statement, right, and it's the front part of it. I won't read through all the details, uh, but here's where the story begins uh, with number one. So we first asked that O'Hare halt the October 2013 changes made to the runway takeoff and landing patterns um, that were done that put the largest increase in planes, resulting noise and resulting pollution over the northwest side of Chicago and the near northwest suburbs that we have ever encountered. These changes, this is a very critical piece of why fair exists, these October 2013 changes were made without any real community input. In fact, the story is a very simple one uh, that got us to this first starting point. In late 2012, myself as one of the two co-founders of FAIR and a gentleman by the name of Andy Ginocchio, who used to be a member of the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission, the ONCC, um, Andy had discovered a document that indicated how the new runways were going to be used. And he thought that it was very important that, that people, we, the citizens, began to see this document. And so in late 2012, he began to shop it around, right? He went to different organizations on the Northwest side and he said, have you guys seen this? Are you aware of what's coming? And so as he came to different civic groups, including the one I belong to, the Edgeworth Community Association, leader after leader, your civic leader said, I've not seen that. I did not know that. And so just through conversation with Andy, uh, who had this great technical knowledge about the changes that were going to happen, I said, Andy, I've got an idea. Let's do this. Let's get a gathering of these leaders together all in one spot, right? That's community building. And let's see what people know. And if we all kind of have a sense that this was something that we have to get in front of, right, in front of the train, uh, we'll do that. And if not, in other words, if we find that in fact this has been put out there and a lot of people knew about this, then we'll probably take a different path. So in early 2013, we gathered together at Edgebrook Public Library, gathered the first seven community leaders together, showed them the document and said, how many of you know this? Not a single person was aware of the changes that were coming in less than one year that was going to impact us. And what we began to realize, and now thanks to the good reporting by the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Tonight, and other media outlets who helped us kind of verify our story with a level of detail that we were not able to do, but we knew was correct, um, the plans for the October 2013 changes in O'Hare, again going back to where I started, were in fact done without any real community input, none whatsoever. Turns out that in 2005, right, these changes were 2013, 
2005, the Department of Aviation, City of Chicago, and the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, held a series of three hearings. I know I'm on camera, so we'll do this in. Three hearings. And those three hearings were done somewhere around O'Hare. The best way to understand it is each hearing was held far enough away from O'Hare where the changes were not going to impact the people who were, uh, to be impacted by the changes. So if you want to ensure that something is not heard or the people who hear it then will not be bothered by it, you go kind of really far away from where the change is going to happen and you do it. And that's, those were the three hearings that were done. They were published in the back section of newspapers. Now we all know, how many of you read a newspaper all the way to the back page including all the little fine print? Okay, we got one hand up. You can't see this. You got one hand up. Okay, so you, you, one of you showed up to the hearings. So that's another thing. If you don't want people to actually be aware of changes, massive changes on an eight billion dollar project, hold three hearings that affects tens of thousands of people. Hold them away from where the changes are going to have the impact, and then put the notice for those hearings in the very back section of the major newspapers. Now what's funny about this is these same organizations, the FAA and the city, so the federal government and the city, when they want to reach you to have you pay your taxes, when they want to reach you to tell you you've got a parking ticket, when they want to reach you to say this or that, they're able to get in touch with us. Isn't that funny? But when it's time to say here's a huge project, it's going to have massive changes in your life, Okay, we'll put a little notice in the back of the paper and we'll hold these meetings kind of farther away from where it's going to be impacted. So that's really kind of the genesis of FAIR. We as community leaders, as civic leaders, as citizens said, gee, we didn't know anything about this and it looks like this is going to have a severe impact on our quality of life. And in fact, unfortunately, it has. So that's the, that's the first policy statement you see up here is we are calling for the October 2013 changes which are now in place to be halted and instead devise a real neighborhood-based community plan for how O'Hare operates on their runways. Second item we asked for is a supplemental environmental impact statement be done. Why? This is pretty simple and straightforward. Planes release a lot of pollution. Pretty straightforward. If you increase massively the amount of planes coming over our homes, our parks, our schools, our children, our lives, Right, wherever those may be, we should have a, an idea at least of what that environmental impact is going to be. Now the FAIR Coalition, you need to, I need to insert this at this point, is not anti-O'Hare, we're not anti-Planes, we get the economic engine that is O'Hare, but we want to have a real say in when and where those engines come over our homes. And when it comes to the pollution, whether that's noise pollution or environmental pollution, that comes from those planes, it is significant. It is significant levels of carcinogens. Again, we get that there's planes. We understand that. But if you're going to do this massive increase, at least let's do a study. Now, here's the interesting thing. The study was done in 2005, and by law, it's not due to be done again for 20 years, 2025, which means everything that was done going to 2005 is probably using data from like the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. This is the time it takes to do stuff. But in between that study and 2025, a lot of changes happen. Trees get cut down. The emerald ash borer cut, uh, caused a deforestation in some areas up on the northwest side of trees. Routes where people live and streets are rerouted. And what was never understood in the environmental impact statement was, well, what would the increase in planes actually do to the noise levels? So they used mathematical modeling that doesn't now match the reality. And we're nowhere near 2025. In other words, it's already incorrect. The modeling they did is already incorrect, and we're only at 2015. So that's the second thing we're asking for, supplemental environmental impact statement, so we can get a true picture of what is going on now that the changes have been made. Third, we ask that O'Hare use, continue to use all runways existing and new. Now this is, seems like a very simple point. How many of you were here in Chicago when we woke up one morning and something happened to an airport that no longer exists called Mixfield. Field. What happened when we woke up that happened in the middle of the night? Big X. Big X. Big X, right. Mayor Daly had a crew from the city go out and bulldoze the runways in the middle of the night. Now, I've long said as someone who was born and raised in Chicago, other than when I was in the military or in college, I've lived here, 
It's a uh, democracy in Chicago is what I call a somewhat sometime democracy. We have it somewhat and some of the time. That was an example where the phrase uh, fits. Um, by doing that, the mayor effectively shut down Mix Field. Because if you remember, there's this discussion around, should we keep, keep Mix Field, should we not? And so we are saying to the powers that be at O'Hare, you will not come in and bulldoze these runways. We are putting you on notice because we've seen that trick once before. And at O'Hare, this is a really, really key point, right? At O'Hare, they have two sets of diagonal runways. You have a handout that uh, shows the two sets of diagonal runways. And those diagonal runways are really important because they allow planes to land and take off when the winds, when the winds are not blowing east-west. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And when, if by any chance, those diagonal runways should be taken down, all of us will be left with runways that only go east-west. And what that means is everybody living directly east and west of the airport, your lives will be forever changed with a level of noise and pollution that we have not even reached yet because the build-out for O'Hare is not done. So it's very important that those diagonal runways in particular are not bulldozed in the middle of the night by whoever is the mayor, right? City of Chicago owns O'Hare. They are responsible for it. It's not the federal government. It is the city of Chicago. The responsibility for that right now lies with Mayor Emanuel. So continue to use all existing and new runways, right? So if you want to come away with one issue or one uh, specific item on number three, it's keep all the runways and especially save the diagonal runways. Fourth point that we're asking for is expand noise monitoring and abatement programs. Uh, noise monitoring is important because it allows us to establish that the map that was drawn with mathematical modeling is incorrect. We reached a level of noise complaints thanks to the FAIR coalition and the citizens of FAIR and the civics of FAIR, again, these building blocks of democracy. In 2014, we reached uh, the highest recorded level of noise complaints ever, ever, at 135,000 noise complaints. The previous high was what? Any guesses? What was the previous high for a year? 54,000. 54? Keep, keep going lower. Yeah, for a year? Or? For a whole year. 23. Other than 2013, which is when we were founded. So 2012 and earlier, what's the highest number of recorded noise complaints? Probably about 10,000. Okay, 10. So we're between 10 and 53. Uh, it hit a high of low 20s. 2014, it is 135,000. So we call it a seven-fold increase. Why? Because we help make people aware of how to report noise through the City of Chicago website and telephonically. And I may talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but that's a massive increase. And what do we do? We educated American citizens on how they may participate in the process of okay, finding no solutions problem. to challenges that they face. So noise monitoring is important not to say that the, the uh, noise complaints are not valid, but for the federal government and for the city department of aviation, they want that data. They kind of ignore the noise complaints, so they want that data. So noise monitoring is important because it kind of validates uh, what the record number of citizens are saying. And noise abatement is exactly what it is. It's soundproofing for schools and for homes. One quick point on this to remember when we talk noise abatement, how many of you would like to be a prisoner in your own home? Raise your hand if you'd like to be a prisoner in your own home. No. Okay, we got one gentleman who raised his hand. Okay, good. Um, so noise abatement sounds cool, right? Oh, I get to have soundproofing and uh, things will be quiet. And noise abatement does work, right? We have enough technology now to soundproof windows, roofs, and doors and such so that it's fairly quiet inside your home. You know what happens when you go to your yard and you have a house that has noise abatement on it? What happens when you go to your yard? It's really, really loud. You know why? Because we can't do noise abatement on yards and on parks and on garages. So noise abatement is essentially an important element of what FAIR speaks to, but it's not sufficient and it's not the solution because we cannot cause people to be prisoners in their home and trade off in our democracy, right? Trade off, I'll take noise abatement in exchange for more and more noise because I won't hear when I'm inside. That's good, except for the one gentleman here is the only one who will not go outside. Everybody else will go outside at some point, and the noise will be loud on a scale that you have never, never heard. Why? Because planes are really, really loud. We get that. And then finally, make Fly Quiet the official mandatory policy for uh, O'Hare. So what is Fly Quiet? Fly Quiet is a program, a Federal uh, Aviation Administration, FAA program, that exists at other airports around the country that says, look, at nighttime, 
only at nighttime, between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., pilots and air traffic controllers together have to make the decision that they can take planes and route them over areas that have what? Less people, more industry, railroad yards, factories, things like that. Makes sense. Airports around the United States have that as mandatory. Chicago O'Hare has it as voluntary. It can be done, we have been told by the aviation experts, in about six months. And it's a really, really kind of simple solution. I use the word lift, like how much lifting do we have to do? This is a, a light lift to be done because it is done at other airports. We have around O'Hare industry and railroad yards and highways, 294, and you all know the geography of that. So we can do this. So we feel fair the five things we're asking for, equitable distribution of traffic, day, night, east, west, north, south, an environmental impact statement that really gets at the impact on our lives, the reduced quality of life, the increased carcinogens, utilizing all runways existing and new, noise monitoring to help us uh, ensure that we have a model for what's actually going on with the noise that's real, not based on real in terms of real impact on people's lives, uh, not based on what uh, someone did uh, many, many years ago now, noise abatement, in other words, when you live in an area that has noise, that you do get soundproofing again, we don't want anybody to be a prisoner in their own home, and then fly quiet, making that the official policy for O'Hare. So that's our policy statement. Um, i got just a few more things to say, and then I'm going to finish up. I think, you know, Tim, you said, uh, I have up to an hour. I will not use an hour. I'm pretty much near the end of uh, uh, what we usually talk about. Uh, new runways. Okay, so what's coming next for O'Hare? There are two more runways slated. October 2015, the next runway we're open. If you know Chicago streets, Berto will be the next one in. And then in 2020, the final uh, runway will open up, and you can look on your map, and you can see kind of the rundown of uh, the rundown, no pun intended, um, of the of the runways. And I'll go into that when you ask me questions. So we have one more runway opening up October 21st, 15, and essentially when that runway opens up from about Grace Avenue, which is 3800 North, to Tui Avenue, which is 7200 North, um, you are going to have, what is that, and it's a three and a half miles, is that about right, 24? You're going to have approximately a three and a half mile highway in the sky of noise and pollution at a level at which the northwest side of Chicago and the near northwest suburbs have never encountered before. Mm. All right, three and a half miles, that's only through 2015 of planes. The FAA's plan is to fly one plane uh, using new technology called NextGen, which is this new radar technology, one plane every 30 seconds to one minute running over those highways. Just visualize that. Look up in the sky, look east when you go outside the restaurant tonight, look up in the sky. If it's not cloudy, you'll be able to see one or two lanes up there and now multiply that five going across the sky 24 hours a day that's their plan 1.2 million flights a year we're only by the way at about 880,000 flights I'm going to say something on that you said well Jack wait a minute if we're only at 880 how do we get to 1.2 exactly you're thinking right college of complexes exactly we're not going to reach 1.2 when the O'Hare Modernization uh, Plan, OMP, was put together, they made projections, and we believe, not sinister, but we believe these projections are done in a way to overestimate the reach of what O'Hare would get to, and that then allows you then to say, oh, we need this much, this many runways, and this kind of capacity. And we get planning, FAIR understands planning, but we also understand that life changes. And when life changes, you need to change your plans, because we, the taxpayers, are paying for a lot of what's out there, a lot of that concrete that's out there. So 880,000, we're at about 60% of the 1.2 million annual, uh, annual flights per year, and American Airlines and United, who would not admit if they're here, but if you read the articles, um, would say one, we don't really want this, and two, we're never gonna reach it. The world's a very, very different place right now. We're not going to reach that level of flights. Why? Because two things are happening. What are the two things? One, anybody flown recently? Yeah. Okay, I fly. What happens on planes now? Are there any empty seats? No. There are no more empty seats. I've been flying for many years. It'd be kind of cool. You get on a plane, you got three seats, one left and right. Pretty normal. You get that on the plane now, I'm not sure why people must have canceled. It is tight, left, right. Am I telling yeah. correct? Yep. So they're packing the planes full, which is fine. That's their business. 
Uh, and the other thing is they're using a lot more smaller planes. The big planes are really overseas, but when you do smaller planes, you can do many more of them, right? Um, and so you put those things together, um, and you get to a point where you say, well, we're, we may be maxed out. Maybe we get to 900,000, 950, but O'Hare says, oh, we need to keep building to 1.2 million. It could be that at some point we get to that, but the plans upon which and the, uh, the data upon which this build-out was uh, planned are nowhere near even close to capacity. And the airlines, American and United, the two major line airlines out there, are balking at the cost because they're picking up some of that tab. So that's a, uh, new runways. Uh, reporting, noise reporting, I talked a little bit about that. We have a record number of noise complaints. I'm going to ask each one of you, any good speaker should ask the audience always to do something. When, before you leave here today, uh, come up and see me. I'm going to say it quickly now, but I will show you how to do a noise complaint. Noise complaints establish that you as a citizen have a right to be heard in our democracy. But, and FAIR wants everybody to report noise complaints. The noise complaint system that the city of Shed has set up is a sham. It's on record, I get it, we say that it's a sham. What do we mean by that? So here's a way to think about it in your mind, visualize this. This is the year when noise complaints started. I'm just going to pick a year, it doesn't matter what, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, you get the idea. On the vertical axis, right, the y-axis, so this is the year, on here is noise complaints. And it goes like this, it's like an upward line, the FAIR coalition is formed in 2013, it spikes up, and we get stronger and stronger and stronger to 1,600 members, 26 civics, and in 2014 it shoots up like that. And now 2015, we're going to expect it to go up. So noise complaints go up and up and up. Do you know what has happened as a result of the noise complaints in terms of having a real seat at the table, changes to the O'Hare Modernization Program, uh, participation in the decision-making and planning process? Zero. 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 That's why noise complaints are a sham. They are a way for the city of Chicago to make us feel like we're doing something that has zero impact. That's a shame. It's a real shame that our fellow citizens who are in these positions of power created a system that is a sham. However, FAIR says report noise complaints, and people have responded. Why? Because if we don't report them, what will be used against us? Oh, well, no one's reporting noise complaints. So we hit a record number of noise complaints, and what do they say? Oh, it's only a few people doing noise complaints. You can't win. You can't win. So we want people, and I'm going to ask each of you when you go home today, and from here on out, report noise complaints fairly and legitimately. I'll show you how uh, to do that. Um, sign up for FAIR, FAIRChicago.org. Where, where, yeah. where do we call for carcinogen complaints? Yeah, so that's good. We have There is no environmental complaint uh, system yet, so that's good. When we get to the uh, Q&A part and back and forth, that may be something uh, that we report on. The reason is, by the way, and this is not defending anything, uh, what we, no control yeah, well also that there's no kind of like device by which most people can carry to measure that. Scientists have it, we don't. But that's the thing to remember about noise complaints. We want you to do them. I'm going to ask each and every one of you to do it and in the YouTube audience to do them. FairChicago.org, go to that website, make a complaint, you can do it right through our website. But the reality is that the city will not make any changes based on it, but again, if we don't do it, then they'll say, well, no one's uh, complaining. Okay, a couple more things. Oh, question. Is it, okay, I don't know your format. Go ahead and finish up. On okay, all right, good. All right, a couple more things. Um, actually, just two more. The O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission, the ONCC. Have any of you heard of the ONCC? No. No, okay. One person has. The ONCC was set up as a deal between Mayor Daly and some of the suburbs who would then agree to the O'Hare modernization program, essentially the expansion of O'Hare in exchange, they would get kind of this body, and this is not meant to be a, uh, as an offense to any of our suburban brothers and sisters because uh, decisions are made by elected officials, many of whom are no longer in place now, that they would have this say in how O'Hare works. That was called the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission. And it's suburban elected officials and their appointees, and then up until recently, uh, two city wards, and that's it, who would gather together once a month and presumably make decisions about O'Hare. It's fully funded by the city of Chicago. Uh, what does that tell you? Uh, who controls the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission? Fifth floor city hall. So you have these suburban agency, or suburban elected officials, most of whom figured out very quickly that the ONCC itself we, we have a phrase for it, it's a sham and it's a, it's a sham and a flip flam, right? So it's just, again, it's like the noise complaints. It has no power whatsoever, 
except for the bully pulpit. And that it could use, but it chooses not to. The Fair Coalition recently called for the resignation of uh, Chairwoman Arlene Mulder. In November and January, uh, she resigned. As a quick side note, in May of 2014, we called for the resignation of Commissioner Rosemary Andalino for failed public leadership, for not including in a democracy the citizens in decision making. In June of 2014, she resigned. So the pressure is real that FAIR has brought. It is real in calling out people who are in leadership roles in a democracy and yet do not involve the citizens in a real meaningful way in the decision making process. So when you hear about ONCC after tonight, and you give it thought, remember it is funded fully by the city of Chicago. It's a sham, it's a flim flam. Having said that, it does have a bully pulpit and with the right chairperson, they're in a search for a new chairperson, actually could at least be that. It has no power, but it could at least be that. And the funny thing is, go to the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission ONCC website, and you'll see their mission is to advocate, it uses the word advocate, which is laughable, to advocate on behalf of residents impacted by noise. Go through their records. You are all very smart people because you're part of the College of Complexes. Uh, go through and look at their minutes and tell me if you find any advocacy actions on their part. There's none. Go to the meetings, they pat themselves on the back, they applaud themselves and then they come the next month, repeat. Pat ourselves on the back, applaud each other, repeat. That's it. Last topic, uh, Mayor Emanuel, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Um, the easiest way to, to explain what I'm about to say is this. In a democracy, even in the somewhat sometime democracy that is Chicago, we the people have a right to meet with our elected officials and it is upon them, it is incumbent upon them to meet with us. We may not come to agreement, we may not like each other or we may love each other, it doesn't matter. The point is we get to meet with them and they are required as part of their office to meet with us. The Fair Coalition 11 times, 11 times we represent tens of thousands of citizens has requested to meet with Mayor Emanuel by sending letters to his office, hand carried through the mail, through uh, an older woman who carried two of the letters, through Twitter, calling, 11 times we have requested. Yeah. Not one time is Mayor Manuel even given us the courtesy of a response. Exactly. Not even acknowledging who we are. Exactly. That to me is disgraceful. As I said up front, I've been working to improve our neighborhoods for over 20 years. Working with a lot of folks, a lot of elected officials. Some of whom are now in jail, some of whom are not. Some of whom I liked, some of whom I didn't, some of whom liked me, some of whom didn't like me. But I have never run into a single elected official, never, who said, I will not meet with you as citizens in a democracy. Never have I run into this. I have no idea what Mayor Emanuel's up to. The Fair Coalition has no idea. His allies apparently are too afraid of him to speak up on this one point. They will not speak up. They will not say anything about Mayor Emanuel, which is a shame because what it says is that he has such a kind of a fear or grip on them that they themselves will, while some of them will speak up on this issue, and we acknowledge that, and I'll get into those names if you ask me who those are, they are afraid to go against Mayor Emanuel. And he, even at a fundamental issue like, do I participate in democracy? So it's a really good kind of opening to closing, and I'm done, opening, we the citizens uncover a massive change that's going to impact our quality of life in a negative way and reduce our quality of life over the world-class neighborhoods and world-class people that live on the northwest side of Chicago and the near northwest suburbs, we uncover that, and as citizens, we act democratically. We do our duty, we do due diligence, we form, we build, we organize, and the main elected official who is responsible for O'Hare, Mayor Emanuel, because the city of Chicago owns O'Hare, and all major decisions about O'Hare fly through the mayor's office, right? Fly through the mayor's office, the mayor refuses to even send us a letter saying, I disagree with you, I dislike you, but I'm going to acknowledge that you're trying to reach me. Does not even give us that courtesy. I've been doing this long enough. I had the opportunity to meet Mayor Daly twice. I met many of his staff, many of the city agencies doing this kind of work. Whatever you think of Mayor Daly, the truth is you could at least get a response from his office, even if it was a disagreement. You can't solve things. You can't find solutions if you're not talking to each other. So we always leave it with this, and I am done. Mayor Emanuel, and I'll look right to the camera. <laughs> For the 12th time, College of Complexes, you get the official, you're on record now as the 12th time falls to you. 
Tonight, Mayor Emanuel, the Fair Coalition asks for the 12th time for you to meet with us as citizens of the northwest side of the city of Chicago, where you have a duty and an obligation to meet with us, to listen to us, to discuss with us, and to make us part of the solution around what we now call the O'Hare problem. It is incumbent upon you to do this. This is time number 12, Mayor Emanuel. Get out from behind the wall you built, come out and be with the people who are impacted by an institution or hair airport that you own. So with that said, I'm going to finish up, and I know there's more to this, but I want to finish up and say just thank you again for allowing the Fair Coalition to be here. Thank you for the dinner, and I'm ready for whatever comes next. Rob's going to gonna come up there and help you moderate. Okay, good. We'll take questions. I'm going to take the first one. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I will recognize part of the park. Part of the park. Questions. This is where I earn my free dinner. I think. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tim Bolger. All right. With the expansion of O'Hare, yes. and whatever, how whatever happened to the third airport, and why can't they use such places as Pawaukee Executive Airport? Schomburg Municipal Airport, which has adequate runway space for jet traffic. Lake in the Hills Municipal Airport. Rockford, where they can bring planes in. I mean, I know that these are general aviation airports and use a lot of things. But why can't we start using some of the other airports around the area and relieve the congestion at O'Hare? Because for me, I can care less about the noise. It's a pain in the ass to get in from Algonquin every time I want to fly. Yeah, right, because of the traffic that goes with it. Um, so let me say something about Piatone. Fair has no position, so thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Fair has no position on Piatone. I know that that is uh, something that the, the southwest and the southwest suburbs are looking at. All I would say to uh, my neighbors down there is, you know, buyer beware. Be careful what you're getting uh, when you put in a major airport. Now, as to the issue of the general aviation, the smaller airports versus commercial, well, here handles commercial traffic. Uh, Parawaki, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, and the other airports you mentioned handle only general aviation, which are, sm maybe they do some small amounts of, of commercial, but those are like the small planes that people own and they fly the two-seaters, four-seaters. And so those uh, airports, and this is not to defend it, Tim, or to attack it, mm -hmm. those airports would need massive build-outs to be able to handle uh, the larger planes of commercial aviation, American Airlines, United, Cargo, and things like that. Uh, so let me say that. So there are very different types of airports in O'Hare. Midway can handle uh, some cargo. O'Hare can handle cargo. Um, the general aviation generally cannot. Um, you may have small planes that have cargo on them, but not. When we think of cargo planes, we think of FedEx, UPS. Those, those size large cargo freighters cannot be handled in general aviation. And one last thing, um, and again, FAIR has no position on it. We just know this, and that is that an airport like Rockford, which can handle uh, cargo, so Chicago and Rockford get into kind of this battle where it's cheaper to land in Rockford, cheaper landing fees, and so therefore they take the business away, if you will, of O'Hare. And so there is kind of this, there is a battle going on, you know, uh, for planes that then end up landing in Rockford. O'Hare does not get the landing fees. When you land a plane at an airport, you have to pay a fee for that. So Rockford gets that. So that's an economic battle that's going on there. And I know the city of Chicago... Excuse me, the city of Chicago wants to recapture some of the cargo. There's, I don't think there's any uh, commercial passenger aviation or if it's not. Wants to recapture some of those cargo dollars that have now gone to uh, Rockford. So, There's a lot of traffic out of Rockford, believe it or not. Yeah, no, Rockford has definitely picked up. And then you have Gary, Indiana, which right. is a one, I think it's two runways, uh, which is tied into the city of Chicago. That has not developed at all whatsoever. I was down there about a month ago. And there was one plane parked in the middle of the runway. There's nothing going on there. It's easier for us to get to Milwaukee than it is Chicago from where I'm at. That's right. That could well be. So I really fair has no position on this, but just to give you a little bit of information around kind of how O'Hare fits into general aviation and then the Rockford, Chicago um, kind of cargo issue, which is really an economic battle between the two airports. David Travis and then Mike Lee. Uh, my question is, don't you think that uh, science and technology being what it is, that in time that the uh, noise that is created by airplanes will be greatly reduced or even eliminated? So that's actually a really good point. I appreciate you asking that question. Remember I said up front, 
The Fair Coalition is not anti-O'Hare, we're not anti-Plain, we get the economic engine that it represents. And so science is part of the answer, but there's two problems with it. One, it's very expensive technology, and two, it takes a long time to implement. So for example, American Airlines has a plane called the MD-80. MD-80 has been a workhorse for American Airlines for many years. I don't know if United flies it, but they have some version of it. But uh, it's been a workhorse for American I've flown it many, many times. Mm -hmm. The replacement of the MD-80 by the next generation of jet, which American Airlines and aviation enthusiasts, for, forgive me, I believe it's the Embraer jet, um, is quieter. It's quieter. And we have technologies that will quiet down uh, the planes, essentially, to what you hear. But again, it's a long-run proposition time-wise, and it's also very expensive. So the answer is yes, and it's a good point, and it does represent part of the solution, but it's not sufficient and can't come fast enough um, you know, for us who are living with this reduced quality of life. Will it be part of the answer? And I know I'm repeating here, yes, it will. And technology is a great part of who we are, right? It's a great part of America, foundation of our economic uh, strength around the world. It just takes time and it costs lots of money, but it is going to be part of the solution eventually. And one more thing on that. Uh, 2011 is when American Airlines began to phase out the MD-80 uh, airline, uh, airplane. They're not even they're not even even anywhere near done yet, and we're in 2015. That's just one uh, one type of airplane that they fly, and they're not even near being done yet. Okay. Um, Mike, Lee? Oh, oh, all right. Um, right. Is there a lawsuit yet? Regarding there's nothing, nothing oh, that's done unless there's a lawsuit. So there is no lawsuit. The Fair Coalition has met with two leading uh, U.S. aviation attorneys, <laughs> and uh, we were told this. Now remember, we're a civic group and a citizens group. That's my background. So I'm actually not really partial to lawsuits because of the time frame. But aviation, know nothing about it. Like many issues, I learn it by getting involved, and so I've learned a lot of stuff and a are lot you, of issues. Are you a lawyer? I am not a lawyer, and I don't play one are, on TV. Are, are one of those 1,600 people a lawyer? We do have attorneys who are in them. Uh, the two national aviation attorneys that we met with said minimum 10 years on litigation, $500,000. Well, so we have not heard. They won't take the case without that kind of upfront. And so for us, that's not... So far, the Fair Coalition has not pursued a legal avenue well, you got for to, that nothing reason. Nothing happens in America without a lawsuit. You know that, right? You nothing know, moves forward. If it, yeah. It's either going to cost you money or you make money. Yeah. That's how America works. Oh, okay. It yeah, costs you bit. money or you make money. Like uh, yeah, right. I, like I see lawsuits you know, for, as a community guy, and again, doing this for over mm -hmm. 20 years in terms of getting changes in neighborhoods for the better. Uh -huh. Lawsuits are part of the answer. <laughs> Sometimes they're a major part, sometimes they're a very minor part or not needed at all. Um, so it depends. I agree with you, and I think a lot of us in FAIR agree that eventually a lawsuit will be part of this, but it won't be the, the main driver of it. Why? That's how things get done. Well, well let, me, let me offer a challenge on that. Why? Because the decision makers at O'Hare, and by the way, FAIR represents Midway also. I haven't talked about Midway. You want to ask me about Midway, yeah, I will answer that. Um, because the decision makers at O'Hare, can in fact do those five things, like for those five things, almost entirely on their own. Almost entirely on their own right now without a lawsuit. I guess you, you know, let me just let me finish on this. For example, the distribution of air traffic, remember I said it started in October 2013? We can't change it, Fair Coalition. It cannot be changed. This is taking years. We've built the runways. we put the plan in place. You know what happened in April of 2014? They change the runway flight patterns because, you're going to laugh, because it turns out that the way that they designed the October 2013 flight pattern changes after years of studying it, had they claimed a safety problem with it. Sure. And on April 2014, they changed the runway patterns. There's two other times they've changed them that we've known about. They may have done it other times. The Air and Water Show, which comes here at the end of August, great show, great thing for Chicago. They have to change the runway patterns for three days. This number three keeps reoccurring. It's kind of biblical. Why? Because you have all the other planes flying around, so they have to reroute the planes. And guess what? Air works. There's one other time when they have to change the flight patterns. Anybody guess when that is? President comes down. I'm at the College of Complexes. Of course, you got it right away. When a president comes to town, and it makes sense, and we get it. But you know what they do? If you look up in the sky when a president's coming, or the vice president, uh, Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense also has uh, his... Uh, own uh, uh, helicopter, right? So that's what they do it for. 
look up in the sky, all of a sudden the patterns change. Yeah, but do you realize the reason they changed this was because they could push more planes through over here? On a, on the yes. diagonal configuration yes. for years. It was an old configuration. <coughs> yep. And the reason they spent twenty billion and bought Daly's contractors to do this is a big daily inside job, by the way. It is, it is, um, that's correct. So the reason that they did this is because they can get more throughput through. And you're gonna right. say, nope, gotta gotta change back. Right. And and I could just see the day where this big honk in 747 hits this big honk in 747 going to this angle, and we got 700 people you know, all over the, the runways. So, and you're going to want to change that? You spent $20 billion. So it's uh, My taxpayer dollars. Yeah, so it's $8 billion. Not no, 20. it's more than $8 billion. Okay. I got well, news for you. Okay, <coughs> so $8 billion is what we go with, which is the official figure. I get that it could be higher. Uh, it's, it is higher. Um, three things on that. First of all, um, O'Hare became the world's busiest airport and was for many years with two sets of the with two Two sets of diagonal <laughs> with two sets of diagonal runways. Air pollution. Two sets of diagonal runways and has had no incidents, fortunately, especially as a guy who flies a lot since 1972. We have great air traffic controllers. We have great pilots in the United States. We have very smart people who look at this stuff and say this is the way to do it. So well before this configuration. Yeah. We had the world's busiest airport for many years. And whether you're the first or second or third, O'Hare has huge numbers of flights and no incidents since 1972. Now, I was a child growing up here in 1979. You were aware there was a plane crash uh, right on the side of 294 that had nothing to do with O'Hare. That, that's not related, so I want to hold that out. Second, 1.2 million uh, flights per year is the expected number of flights by 2016. I said earlier we're at 880,000, and we're one month into 2015, so they have 11 months to add in 40% well, capacity. To it's not going to come. Because it's not going to come. That's part of the city of Chicago. That, that is O'Hare correct. O'Hare, O'Hare Airport is part of the city of Chicago, and Round Manual makes five bucks or ten bucks on each passenger that passes. No, it's much more. And that's than why that, he yeah. will not answer your phone call because yeah. he makes money on that sucker. Yeah, the, the, it, it is a public good, though, and I hear what you're saying, and this is why we stand up as citizens in a democracy, and I've done this for many years. You stand up, you make your voices heard, and you say, we want to yeah, be you, part of the you solution. You can't stand up, you got to be tough. All right. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Billionaires. Okay. Big business. We're not afraid. All right, okay. all right. Yeah. 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 I'm on video telling you, like, my name, Jack Charlier, where I live. You know, it's okay. They know where I live. You're fighting big oil. You're fighting big military. You're fighting big aviation. Okay. Yes, Eliana? I would like asking you, if I may, what you were going to do if they will continue not to respond from your, from your request. Uh -huh. What if the government, this Emmanuel, whatever yes. his name, if you will not respond, then what you were going to do, guys, about it? Mm -hmm. So actually, it's a great question. Thank you. Very good timing. Because Just you haven't responded, right, from them not helping me respond. So we don't think it's wasting time. I appreciate the question. It's a good one. We don't think it's wasting time. We are very fortunate to live in a democracy where we get to do this and get to say that we want to say. We believe that, uh, and what I've learned as a citizen, is what's on our side ultimately is, in fact, time. Because every politician will at some point no longer be in office. So even if we have to just kind of go through this and bear with it for a while, we will ultimately have, you know, our, the phrase we say is, either the mayor does the right thing or we need the right mayor. And let me say something. <laughs> say. Too late, too late. Well, let me say something on that. In um, early December of 2014, the Fair Coalition uh, held a mayoral forum. We invited all the mayors, Mayor Emanuel, I mean all the candidates for mayor, including Mayor Emanuel, um, to come and speak before Fair. We packed wall to wall the VFW Hall in Park Ridge. We are, we're, we're in city and suburbs. Well, this is not. This is your organization. This is not fair. So Why you do you guys, show up? huh? Where those people show up? Other people show well, up. well, this is this is your organization. I'm as your guest, and so I appreciate the invitation. Um, but so we packed the VFW Hall out in Park Ridge, and um, three candidates show up. One of whom, unfortunately, has dropped. She spoke uh, very well. The two others who showed up are uh, Alderman Bob Fioretti and. Uh, Commissioner Jesus Chewy Garcia, right? And uh, so Mayor Emanuel and none of the other candidates showed up. Chewy Garcia, I want to say this because we put this out. Uh, we ask each and every one of our uh, citizens in FAIR to actively get involved in the mayoral campaign for the city of Chicago, whether you're a city or suburbs, 
and the only person right now that has signed the fair letter of support is Commissioner Garcia. And so we acknowledge him, we thank him for his support, and we have pushed out to our members many times how to get involved with the campaign, how to make a donation to the campaign, how to walk precincts, right. how to pass out literature. Why? Because he supports fair. We don't endorse candidates, and if other candidates come forward, including Mayor Emanuel, and all of a sudden signs our letter, we will then tell our members, now here's another candidate you can choose from. You're free to choose anyway, you're free to do nothing, but here is the only one who has signed our letter, and that is Commissioner Garcia, and so we want to acknowledge that. Yes. All right, uh, Eliana. No, she had a question on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Steve. All right. Hey, I just have a few questions, okay, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. did, did, did you work with BGA, the Better Government Association? Have you ever heard of them? I have, and we have not worked with them yet. What government watchdog group did you work with to get things rolling and uh, really grip uh, with these complaints? What watchdog group? None. FAIR created its own apparatus for doing what we did. We did not work at government. So the came from each other, all the 1,600 members? Uh, citizens and civics. That's the building blocks of the work that I do, yes. And then how, how, did, how do you know the plans for the new runway that's being currently worked on, how do you know these plans? How, 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 do you, how are you able to get a hold of those plans? Internet. Yeah, so uh, because of the pressure FAIR has brought, you can you can find out the expected usage, runway usage for uh, the new runway coming into Berto Runway in October 2013. However, I want to put a little asterisk on that. Um, when the FAA and Chicago Department of Aviation released the original numbers, um, around how these runways were going to be used. Uh, and thanks to Rosalind Rossi at Chicago Sometimes, she uncovered this. The information that they released turned out not to be correct. Uh, Was it intentional or not? That's a leap. You have to assign motivation and judgment, and I'm always cautious to do that because I don't want that done to me, right? <laughs> um, I'm always cautious, but the original numbers they put out actually are, do not match. Uh, they're 40 to 60 percent off the actual numbers that are actually going on now. So even with the numbers being released, we're aware that that may not ultimately be the actual use so, of the runways. So it was the Sun Times that uncovered that information. That That's right. Rosalind Rossi okay. dug through the three meetings I referenced, far away, hit <laughs> in the back of the paper, and said, "Oh, by the way, these are this is the information." And they might be, this is going back quite a few years. So you had, she had to go find the actual documents that were handed out and the minutes. And but for the fact that our government, uh, you know, keeps minutes, we wouldn't even have known that. I was at one of those. So, things. so, so, so I, you're, you're one of the very, very few. So, so we, <laughs> we, we heard you loud and clear. Uh, so when okay. I ask, I want to ask, how will you mitigate noise at O'Hare, stop the planning and building of new runways, and, 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 or to finish them, <coughs> and who who is not helping you at the table? I mean, we hear that nothing is really happening. So, so, right. sir. What's next, man? What are you going to yep. do? Are you going to be spinning your wheels, doing the same thing over and over, hoping for something different? Or what's the next plan? What's, like this gentleman said about yep. lawsuit, something's got to change no control with your push. Over EPA. What, 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 what will right. change, EPA sir? does not. I agree with that. Correct. Yeah. What, 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 what will change, sir? Mm -hmm. So right now, it's a good question. Uh, our leadership team actually just met last night, as a matter of fact. Um, so right now, we are focused on the mayor's race. Uh, that is our main focus. And so what comes after the mayor's race, we do not know yet. What we do know is if we get a change of mayor, and say Commissioner Garcia, again, we don't endorse candidates, but Commissioner Garcia has signed our letter, we believe that door will open huge avenues for solutions. Absent that happening, or say someone else signs the letter and then says, fair, um, I signed your letter, I'm now in office, I will now assist you. Absent that, we don't know yet because we are very much focused on the short run of the mayor's race, and that is just kind of where it is. Gotcha. So, microphone. Tim, microphone. I think your mic went out, which I'm good with, but if you need to hear the audio, okay. I know it's being uh, We can't that hear you. We can't hear you. But, but yeah. let, me, let me say something else, because it's a really important question. Okay. Hold on, hold on, buddy. Hold it's on. It's recording. Yep. Here we go. It's on. It's a really, really important question in the democracy when citizens engage in democratic action understand that uh, these things can take a lot of time. Even very simple things, um, like getting a new stop sign, a new playground, can take lots of time. It is frustrating it, you know, sometimes for us. Um, I've done it long enough where I kind of am used to it, but when you get people who are new to it, which is understandable, um, 
it's not like a business, you know, like businesses that move fast, or the internet, or Twitter that moves fast. A lot of civic engagement is slow, painstaking uh, work. I want to say something about, by the way, the, those three hearings, and this is a little bit off, but it's back to the earlier question. Um, I remember in the neighborhood I used to live, I grew up in the Irving Park neighborhood in Chicago, so Irving and Plasky, and one of the earliest kind of issues I dealt with was street uh, changes that were being done, uh, circles, traffic circles, and diversions, and stop signs. And I, I thought it was really funny when we found out that the FAA and the Chicago Department of Aviation held just three hearings for this $8 billion project, because I reflected back upon my days of uh, doing hearings for stop signs, and I've now come to the conclusion, you know, when we put in stop signs, one stop sign, we have like eight, nine meetings about one stop sign on one side street. But they had three hearings on an $8 billion project that was going to affect tens of thousands of people. So just, you know, from a democracy standpoint, it's not rational. Public policy can be irrational. How it moves isn't orderly or logical. But it does move if enough large, massive citizens focus. You can make change. It just may not come out when and how you want it. But you can, in fact, impact change and I would advise anybody here or anybody watching this on YouTube later to not give up, to just believe. Yes. We're getting quite a lot of echo. It should be okay now, Brown. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Tim? I'd like Tim to Walter. know a little bit about your own personal background, why you got involved in FAIR and why are you volunteering? Yes. So I'm born and raised in Chicago um, and my background starts um, on this issue. Uh, in my early 20s, uh, what I decided to do was to kind of take a look around and see how could I do something meaningful in the community in which I lived, which is Irving Park. And I got involved, uh, which is where I cut my teeth, kind of on the civic side, if you will, with an organization called the Old Irving Park Association, OIPA, which still exists today. It's a very strong and powerful civic, and I use that word power in a good sense. Um, that word has kind of a lot of meaning today, but a very powerful civic. And was active in that learned about zoning issues, the Kennedy noise, I remember when they were doing uh, uh, reconstructing the Kennedy Expressway, noise abatement, stop signs, traffic signs, trees, kind of all the basic things that go to make good neighborhoods, how to work with people, how to build relationships. And from that I found, first of all, a real passion within me to do this work to improve our neighborhoods, but I also found that you can, in fact, impact real change. And so in my early 20s, that's when it started. Like for many of you, some early in your life, you began to do something and you found yourself to enjoy it. You found that it made a difference, that it improved things. And so I just kind of kept, uh, kept doing that over the years. And I've been involved in a variety of issues, uh, civic issues, community issues, neighborhood improvement issues over the years. Uh, still enjoy it and uh, feel very much that when I look back kind of on a career, if you will, although I don't get paid to do it as a volunteer, that there's a lot of good things that have happened, not for me, but for my involvement with others. This is really key to civic engagement versus political engagement. Me with others working together to build community to find solutions. If I were a politician, I would stand up here and say, thanks to me. But to do civic work is to say thanks to us, all of us. It's a fundamental difference of democracy with a small d. All of us to be involved together to say we each have value, we are equal to one another, all our voices make sense to be together, and we move as one body together. Democrat, Republican, Green Party, no party, who cares? In fact, it's better not to have any kind of those parties around on the community side, but that's how it is. So I'm, it's a passion, it's an interest, helps our neighborhoods, makes us live better. As a follow-up, do you have advice yes. for anybody wanting to get involved in something like this and what would that piece of advice be? Yeah, actually, it's a great question, and I have a few pieces of advice. First of all, don't do it alone. Civic work, community work, is not about doing it alone. It's about doing it together. Two, go slow. That's a, kind of a horrible thing to say, but you have to understand that when you do community work and you do civic engagement, you are stepping into what I call the sandbox of the political world that intersects with the business world, that intersects with the community world, the economic world, it can be very complex and you want to be successful. So don't do it alone, go slow, not slow intentionally, but realize, think. Like you say, college are complexes, right? The playground for people to think. In fact, I like that I use sandboxes and sandboxes are on playgrounds. <laughs> think at each and every step, 
who are the players, the organizations that I need at the table with me to get to success. Do not move too fast. Now, a little bit in the weeds. If it's not a very technical issue, like getting a stop sign up, you're going to move faster and you're going to need less people. If it's a more complex issue, you're going to need more people, more organizations, and it's going to take longer. So go slow. Get, don't do it alone. Get the right people. Those two things, you know, be patient. They, it pretty much works. It does work. Thank you. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, Jack, uh, are you familiar with uh, something called the Yes But Construction? I, I am not, but I'm willing to learn. How about that? You said they can have an airport, but as the defining feature of your organization, and um, what kind of airport are you willing to allow them to have? And, well, my major question is, who are the deciding officials regarding airports? Is it Metropolitan Planning Council? UN. FAA? Nope. The airlines? UN. The mayor? Alderman? No transportation? It's largely aldermen? Okay. Who is it? You asked me three questions, and let me try to do justice. Who decides? The major player for O'Hare Airport is the mayor of the city of Chicago, the fifth floor of City Hall. O'Hare is owned by the city of Chicago. The weaker player in that is the FAA. We call it the weak stepsister, and there's uh, nothing implied by that. It's just kind of an analogy um, to the city of Chicago. That is not true for all airports. It just so happens, though, the city of Chicago owns O'Hare. It makes most of the decisions around what happens. So who decides? The mayor of the city of Chicago, and by extension through the agencies, uh, which is the Chicago Department of Aviation, right, or the agency and the commission of the Department of Aviation. But that commissioner, like Rosemary Andalino, you know, does not make their own decisions, right? Especially in Chicago, the somewhat, somewhat time democracy, they're really responding to the mayor. Then the FAA is the number two player. Sadly, the suburbs are almost entirely left out of the equation, and that bothers us at FAIR and me personally quite a bit as a community guy. No one should be left out of it. And what FAIR advocates for, remember I said up front, going back to the beginning, is our purpose is to get a real seat at the table for citizens to have a voice in how public decisions are made. Number two, what kind of airport? I'm going backwards in your question, sir, or Charlie. Uh, what kind of airport? An airport where the citizens who are impacted by the changes at O'Hare have a real seat at the table. That, oddly enough, could look exactly like what we have now. But what's the difference? What's the difference? We had a say in it. If you have a say in something, and this is what unfolds from having a say in it, you at least have to say, kind of funny, right? <laughs> at least say, well, look, I had a say in it. We had a real voice, and this is what we came up with. Therefore, we accepted a democracy as a community. This is how we want it to unfold. We don't accept the ideal. We're not shooting for the ideal, whatever that is. In other words, we want to have a say. And having a say, think about your own life. Would you prefer to have a say in something, even if it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to, or not have a say in things? I know what I would want is to have a say in things. Why bother? Okay, I have a question yes. on yes. that point. Good. And that is going to be long period, forever. Then have questions. You have great uh, questions, by the way. Great <laughs> questions. Are you likely uh, to sit at, yep. uh, to have a say? Sure. Uh, who is going to make the determinations and uh, uh, how? Just how much say, uh, how can you be fairly apportioned uh, a weight in the, uh, in the discussion uh, or the determination of the uh, uh, <laughs> number of planes per hour, per right. runway, per whatever? Yep. So, Brown, that's a great question. There are, there are something around the United States at other airports called community roundtables. Really simple name, right? You get the idea. These community roundtables are the mechanism that we are shooting for, right? So I mentioned earlier the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission. That is not the forum because it's fully funded by the city of Chicago. It is wholly owned. So we are seeking what's called a community roundtable, which is a legal entity that is made up of everybody but the FAA. Isn't that interesting? Everybody but the FAA. And that's not to be exclusionary, that's just kind of how they're formed. And it has civic representation. There is no civic representation 
right now, for example, at the O'Hare Noise Compatibility Commission, nor anywhere else is there civic representation. Civic being us as citizens, not elected officials, but as citizens that has civic representation, that has representation from the pilots, the airlines, the air traffic controllers, the people who own the airport, uh, could be the flight attendants, could be anybody. The point is, there's a table that is democratic in nature. What are the details of that, Brown? I don't know, because we don't have it yet. It's a hypothetical. Don't answer hypothetical questions, right? Or as all my researchers' friends say, it depends. It depends. <laughs> what we do know is that the table that exists right now has no civic representation, none whatsoever. The air traffic controllers are not at the table right now. The pilots are not at the table right now. So the table's already uh, broken to begin with because the, the main players the who EPA? are there are not even there. Right? The so the, the table doesn't even make sense already as it's constructed right now. All right. Where's the um, EPA? They're the ones that should be there. Ileana has come up with their question. Okay, very quick, if I may. I'm yes. sorry. No, no, I'll just. I don't know. I mean. Can you speak up, please? No. So, okay, so my question is, what do you think, you mentioned another guy like the mayor, and my question is, what do you think about priority, priority, whatever you want? I don't know, I don't know, believe me, I'm not even, I'm not sure if I even be involved, because how, I don't trust politicians, I don't trust, you know, many people who, um, who are created with politics, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's my choice. I really don't trust them, not for one second. So, and I'm very careful, I am very, very what's cautious. Question? Okay. So I my question know. is... Okay. So what's the what, question? If you Who mention... Knows? If you mention... <laughs> this guy, so what do you think about... Him? One fool at a time, please. Yeah. So... Maybe if you're ready, you can help. Maybe you guys have to follow your own ground rules. Um, I got a question. So uh, I can't comment on uh, Fear Ready other than say this. Uh, we wish that Alderman Fear Ready would sign the letter for Fair Coalition and again acknowledge that Commissioner Garcia has signed our letter um, and so we are supportive of that action. And we would love that Mayor Emanuel will sign our letter and all the other candidates because that gives us a broad base of people who say, I agree with you. So that's the best I can answer. I, I can't comment on Alderman Fear Ready. What's Lots of hands right. up. What is the water you going to do? Over here, over here. Yeah, Bravo, Bravo. 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 All right. Bravo. 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 All right. Uh, Bravo. 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 Quiet. One fool at a time. <laughs> uh, other Kennedy Airport in New York, uh, LAX. LaGuardia. Yeah. LaGuardia. Hartfield. How are they managed? Do you know? Like, we like don't good even or know. Bad or, or like maybe how they match. So do they have? Like, do they have? Well, so so uh, 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 yeah. So community roundtables do exist. We actually at Fair are in conversation with uh, international airports in Germany and London, Belgium, believe it or not, but uh, also uh, New York, Minneapolis, Phoenix, um, John Wayne Airport out in California, uh, Orange County, excuse me, uh, Miami Dade County. Um, a couple of those airports, and I say a couple because I'm doing this from memory, and my memory. After too many years of playing rugby is not good, right? Uh, uh, 11 years of playing rugby, my memory is mostly gone. Um, but I will tell you that there are reports in the United States that uh, have community roundtables. In fact, that's where the model comes from. We did not make it up. That involve uh, pilots, that involve air traffic controllers, that involve the airlines, that involve the officials who own it, and citizens sitting at a legal table that support It's a legally mandated table that allows... Uh, process for fair decision making to happen. So I, I'd like to be specific, but I won't because I'll probably get it wrong if I'm relying on memory. Okay. Hey, now, Mike Lee. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. I did a lot of research in this oil and aviation and transportation crap. So, okay, first of all, I have never bought this economic engine crap. Okay, you know, 90% of the people aren't frequent flyers and aren't world travelers. It's there for the idle rich or businessmen. That 10% of the population, most flights, one. So where do you come out with an, uh, 
And all it is is in half the flights at O'Hare are people flying in and getting on another plane and hauling their butt somewhere else. So okay, so where do you get the economic engine thing from? One, and then they leave all their pollution here. And two, do you realize that aviation is the most coddled industry? Not only is it the only industry. So that what's your question? Yeah. Well, I want to yeah. know why is it an economic oh, engine? Why? One, and do you? I want to know if he has an answer for this. Do you know that aviation doesn't pay taxes on their fuel? I have to pay. 60, 70 cents per gallon when I go to a gas station. They don't have to pay taxes on their fuel, uh, jets. Two, I my taxes have to pay for all the security, which is in the range of 10 to 20 billion a year. And three, EPA has no control, only in the street. Do you realize all those things? I don't now think I you realize do. all those things. So now you do. You. Now you know that. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will tell you, O'Hare, when we use the phrase economic engine, yeah, I've been is, that a lot of people use that. It, there are a lot of people who have jobs out there, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have a steady paycheck. I believe in it. And O'Hare is a public good. It's not an evil, fair support. It's what the O'Hare most is. Point in Chicago. It's the most carcinogen. Please, you asked a question. Point in Chicago. Let the man answer. So, yeah, and, and, and so I was just saying, yeah. it is an economic it's engine, the most and it has a Same for a bottle. And, you know, we're, we're good with that. We get that for Okay. Okay. All right, Brown. I think I think it's time we maybe move to rebuttals. Would that be okay? No. Hey, CP's got a question. No. You gotta get informed on the other's question. Yeah. All right, Charlie. I don't know. You can listen to crap from the other week. Oh, let's say all that phony question. Hey, bring back. This is the Shark Tank. This is the Shark Tank. We'll make a deal then. Charles, will you please ask your question? Yes, sir. Uh, I came here. I'm a Southwest Sider, and I'm surprised to learn on the that you tell me that you take in pollution across the city. Uh, yet you kept talking about neighborhoods, and and then I look at the bottom of your brochure. And it says your coalition, a community organization, to the distribution of O'Hare aircraft. Mm -hmm. Are you citywide organization or are you a neighborhood group? Well, we're city and suburbs together, and uh, early in, actually, late 2014, the Fair Coalition then uh, joined forces with some neighbors for Midway Airport, and so Midway is now part of us. So we're citywide um, now. I am only speaking about O'Hare because here we are on the northwest side of the city and uh, generally people are interested kind of in where they live. So if you're on the southwest side, I'll be glad to talk a little bit about Midway Airport. It is yeah. a smaller part of the coalition <laughs> because it's a newer part, not even with us yet for six months and we are still kind of building up through citizens and civics down there in the early stages of uh, building around Midway Airport. One additional question. Uh what other environmental or organizations have you dealt with or civic planning organizations? So we've not dealt with any environmental organizations in terms of partnership nor civic planning organizations. Can you elaborate a little bit on what's going on at the Midway? Sure. So Midway's story is actually a lot like O'Hare's story, um, just kind of smaller scale. In uh, February of 2014, uh, the, get ready for the story, the city and the FAA changed the flight patterns over Midway. How many of you think anybody knew anything about it? Right, exactly, no hands go up. It was the exact same story. And I'm going to go back to the Sun-Times just because they're the ones uh, you know, who did some good work on this. We actually were very focused on our hair and very much are. Um, in interviewing people when the changes were made in February 2014, a couple months later, people realized, gee, there's planes flying overhead that I've never seen before, didn't know anything about this. Uh, they went back and interviewed some public officials who claimed to have forgotten whether or not they were at a meeting or invited to meetings about this. That's the same story at O'Hare. There were no meetings uh, held in regards to the changes from Midway, and there are neighbors down there who are now being impacted by flights that go over their homes and never did before. And again, the point isn't that 
planes are going over people's homes because there's an airport there. We get that. The point is, did you have a say in being part of the decision-making process in a democracy? And in a democracy, we get to have a say. Never, ever give up the right to have a say. Never trade that off for anything because there's no dollar amount you can attach to that. There's nothing that can be traded for that. And so the story of Midway, while smaller in scale, is the exact same story. Decisions made without any real community input. And no body exists by which to have the decisions made that are inclusive of people. Now I'd like to know how many people have something to say to the rest of us. Okay. David? They're not. All right, let's thank our speaker for going to rebuttals. Thank you. What do we do now? Okay. You get to sit down and listen to us spout off now. No, I'm good with that. I wanted to make sure I follow your... You have. Your, your process is uh, fair to what you have asked of me. In exchange for the free dinner, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 not at all. I, I appreciate actually, I learned from listening to other people, and so I, I very much appreciate what's going to come next. I'm going to take my pen and notepad with me to write things out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. And that's polluting. All right, let's. Uh, right here. All right, I'll give the first rebuttal. All right, well, well we're not going to be... T uh, I remember yeah. when I was a student at Evanston uh, at uh, uh, Garrity Evangelical Theological Seminary that we had planes going over all the time. Not only over the dormitory, but during classes and, and uh, worship and just about anything that was going on was cute planes and they were yeah, noisy and now I realize that we are on the path to O'Hare uh, and from O'Hare uh, but you know, if you looked up in the sky there were always these planes so uh, you know, it, it, some, there were times uh, when uh, the professors uh, would have to pause while a plane went over uh, because you couldn't hear them. Uh, <laughs> and I, I wonder if it affects you know, uh, Jean-Luc. Uh, uh, do you have planes going over your school uh, or, or Nina? Um, uh, I went to the school in our neighborhood. Um, my brother and sister do though, so um, um, uh -huh. I don't know. Over our house, yes. Over our house, yeah. Anything that's I can get for you. No, we'll take it though. Over the house, but, but uh, it doesn't interfere yeah, much in school. Right now. Yeah, I go to a, sure. I live in North I'm going to make it out right now. To a young soul. Right now. Yes. Now, okay. Well, it's in the flight pants. 
Yeah, those trains don't burn nearly the oil. Doesn't matter where they live. Well, it's noisier uh, in a flight path or in a certain neighborhoods than it is in others. My Northwestern University who pushed this expansion. So if the flight path isn't that loud there. Well, you're in Edgebrook or Norwood Park or something like that or uh, Norwich. It's very, very loud. Anyway, this is the most carcinogenic and polluting industry in the world. And they have no EPA controls. It's incredible. There's a little department of the UN based in Montreal, Canada that controls aviation, and they don't do anything about it. it, it aviation is so nasty, that airport shouldn't even be there right now. It is so polluting. Um, and like I said, it's mostly for you know business frequent flyers or idle rich going on vacations. I, I don't see the economic engine purposes there. Here, here's a, a little bit of a, a pollution uh, from the National Resource Defense Council and U.S. Citizens Aviation Walk, a fellow that wrote a book um, reporting on uh, airports, uh, airport near Seattle. Their data indicated that there's a 57% higher asthma rate, 28% higher pneumonia influenza rate, 26% higher respiratory disease rate, 83% higher pregnancy, pregnancy complication rate, 50% higher infant mortality rate. Oh. On, on, yes, in print, in a book, data oh, checked, peer reviewed. Something it's a big <laughs> stinky mess, that old hair. That big oil. I was at these EIA, EIA meetings. I was there. It was a big railroad. Right here, guess what I have highlighted? Number one carcinogen producer in the state of Illinois, O'Hare Airport. Uh, a foam products company in West Chicago. There's another foam company in Bridgeview. A lot of foam companies. <laughs> I guess they even got nasty crap in there. Anyway, there's your part of your proof. Uh, O'Hare is nasty. And I think you've got to fight these people. Anyway, guess what? I was at the EIS meetings. I probably won, and there were a lot of people there. But you know who else was there? Big oil, big daily, big daily contractors, big aviation, big FAA, all the people you know, that were going to make money on that, OK? Big American Airlines, big United Airlines. And here's little old Mike Lehman. Or Mike Lee, as you folks want to refer to me, which is fine. And I got my little proposal that they spit on and laughed at and stomped on. It says airport expansion alternative. Build a bullet train, they will come. It doesn't use oil, and it would reduce half the airline trips at O'Hare. They're building it all over the world, electric bullet trains. Okay? You ever heard of a bullet train? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're building these all over the world. They don't cause pollution. They don't cause noise. But guess what? Big oil and big daily and big aviation and big FAA and all those folks don't want us to do that. That's fine. Anyway, so, you know, that's... Absolute power corrupting absolutely, I guess. Uh, what else did I say? Yeah, this, and this economic engine stuff. I know Gilman told you on PBS, and I saw your interview. I'm glad you're trying to stand up to Big Northwestern, Big Aviation, Big Water. Yeah, that's who, who's going to fight this. You've got to be tough. You can't have this community organization stuff. And, Get some better lawyers. Get these lawsuits going. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta fight the fire. You're fighting, you're fighting all these big organizations and big money. You know, so I do, I do not like carcinogens going into young, young people's lungs. Absolutely.
I don't like all these volatile, or, you know, volatile, crazy organisms going into kids' lungs or into my lungs either. It's a nasty, nasty business. And it's a very, very secretive business. I have a Boeing shirt on. I noticed that. I noticed the Boeing shirt. You know what that stands for, don't you? Uh, Bombs over everything. <laughs> half of their business is building bombs, half of their business is building your own. Bless you! What else do you guys want to know? Anything else you want to know about oil or aviation or pollution? What standards are you using for pollution of aircraft? Um, have you ever heard of the EPA? Yeah, but what's one? The Environmental Protection Agency, that one. Well, they have certain standards. There's no standards for carbon dioxide. I'm not even talking about carbon dioxide. I'm just talking about car carcinogens and air pollution, period, and noise pollution. And not regulated. Yeah, it's nice. It's the only industry in the United States that's not regulated for pollution, well, aviation. Isn't that nice? And they don't have to pay taxes on oil and get in jet fuel. Isn't that nice? They're not polluting them. <laughs> oh. You're wrong. Tell all the kids on the Northwest Side that'll be breathing carcinogens decades from now and air pollution decades from now. I'm not a frequent flyer. I don't need that airport right here. Okay. You guys should hand these out to your organization. U.S. bullet train at Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> and start getting with the program and use sustainable transportation. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what did the, the bullet train is not on electricity. Yep. So what did that electricity need to like burn coal or oil? Yeah. Or yeah. So Good, if excellent if question. If it's going to melt the polar caps anyways, does it matter? What right. That's a, that's a common response. But guess what's going on right now? There's a country called Germany. Okay. And they're a third of the size of the United States. So the United States has 300 million people. They have 100 million people. They have, a, they have half of their electricity is now considered sustainable by wind farms and solar. Right now, California is putting in so many solar panels, it's incredible. There's going to be a time when you're about my age that most electricity is going to be coming off of solar panels and roofs and wind farms. So guess what also runs an electric bullet train? Solar panels and wind farms. Isn't that beautiful? And there's no car, and I'm not even talking about climate change. Yeah. Boy, aviation, that's a big contributor to climate change, too. And I'm not even going to breathe it, bring it up. Carbon footprint, that kind of stuff. How much time did I use? You used 10 minutes. I had a lot to say. I know, but it's okay. <laughs> hey, Charlie's coming up, don't listen. No, I'm big oil right. guy. Because I know what I'm talking yeah, about. All right. Big Jeff, all right, right. I'm going next, next Charlie. Charlie. Oh, all right. Oh, you know, you bring up a nice point. How is this stuff going to be powered? And we're going to be debating that come August, come April 18th here when John Kutch pairs off against uh, Dennis Nelson. John Kutch being a member of the Thorium Energy Alliance and uh, Dennis Nelson. For me, solar and wind are not going to cut it. If you do the math, you're not going to be able to power an advanced industrial society doing it. And if you really want to power an advanced industrial society, you're going to have to go with another power source that we've been using for 60 years. And that's going to be nuclear power. Not the way we've been doing it now in the light with, with the big time reactors, but small modular Gen 4 thorium powered reactors. When you can take the entire energy needs and put it into a size of thorium about the size of the circle of my hand for your entire lifetime supply of energy needs it's time to take a look and listen we can also burn up our nuclear waste that we have at our present plants all it would need would be sequestering for about 400 years and it would become safe to use I don't really want to get into the technical details of what these are because you can readily find them at the Thorium Energy Alliance. 
which I happen to be very active with. So, you want to sell climate change? You want to power an advanced industrial society? Sure, there's a place for solar and wind, but it ain't going to cut it as far as all of our power needs. At best, perhaps maybe 10%. And oh yes, a little bit about Germany. Yes. They're getting about a half of their power from France, which is about 80% nuclear right now. <laughs> and you're going to have to remember something else. You go ahead and fact check it. I would please do, because right now a lot of people are regretting in Germany going down that route. It's going to take a lot more power than you think. Even yeah. you know, when you start looking at things like data centers and the infrastructure behind the web, there's a lot of power. It's been estimated at eight percent right now is required just to run our internet and other activities. If you want a clean non-polluting source for greenhouse gases, save the planet, take a look around you. Get the power from the rocks. Thorium is abundant, it's clean, it can be useful. The reactors called the liquid fluoride light water reactors do not have to operate at high pressure. A building about the size of this restaurant could empower the entire north side of the city. That, for me, is real progress. We'll run a bullet train. That's not real. We'll run a bullet train. Yes, it's Charlie. All right. Tim, we'll run a bullet train. That's, 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 well. okay. that's mythical. <laughs> it's not mythical. They've been doing it since the 1960s. Yeah, it's it's not right. It's Charlie it take, <laughs> It's mythical. It would take 10 years to develop. Uh, China's got China's got three hundred people. Hey, all right, it's going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, you, I, 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 I like <laughs> language, and yeah, there is an echo on this thing. Why don't we get um, get the echo down? Um, yeah, the organization. It's based on a yep, yes by construction, my favorite type. I mean, you say, uh, you're out on a date, and you say, yes, you're a lovely girl. But <laughs> uh, you have to be careful with those. You, you want a place at the table. You want to let them have airports, but under your conditions is what I'm saying. Yes, sir. The organization is defined in that way. Uh, this thing about, oh, we'd like to have a say at the table, um, unless you come in as an equal partner in the decision-making process, I don't see it bothering with anything else. I'm the union official, and as such, I've told them here, when i in a room, I'm equal to the highest management official in that room. And if they offer organized labor very often. We will consider your views and opinions. I don't even bother because you really have little or no, actually you have no influence on the final decision. So I, I, um, unless you define that in a little better fashion here. Um, uh, it's easy to give advice. I think you would expand if you're truly a citywide organization then become one. And we do that in public transit. We, in fact, try to restrict uh, neighborhood issues from oh, David, arising. Okay, David, relax. I don't want to um, see on you like that. Seriously, try to talk system-wide like in transit as opposed to my neighborhood. No, it's, it's difficult. What I mean by that, I think you'd have greater appeal. I advertise this thing to the ecological community, and I don't know if they're attuned to it yet. But if you made it like the city is being polluted, something in that fashion, it's easy for me to give advice. It's not my organization. But I advertise to the, with the Chicago Greens, Illinois Green Party, Sierra Club, uh, environmental Illinois, um, but if you have a more even suburban um, approach to this, I think you would have better recruitment efforts. That's easy. You know, and the other thing I was thinking, this thing about fair, 
we want what's fair is kind of kind of weak. <laughs> we, you know, but that's nice. I, it's, it's, this is no big deal here. Now, my friend Mike. Yes. You have to define pollution. It's not a feeling in your heart. You have to have. What do you think comes you up? You have to there? have standards Shh. that are in Title V of the United States Code, or the State of Illinois statutes, to define pollution. Um, you also, they're called permiss PELs, permissible exposure levels, in, in occupational safety and health things. And what are those standards? Do they exist? What is coming out of airplanes? You gave away something there when you said, well, it affects chill babies. That, to me, raises the flag that when I hear that, I go, they don't have, that's no standard at all. Everything affects yeah, babies. Exactly. No, we well, you gave yourself away. No. You should be able to cite the law. They're exempt. No. But then you don't have a, the time. Then you Please, have to Mike. go establish them. And that would be a legitimate aim of the organization until such time when I come in and I say, you are endangering my employees by exposing them to such a substance. We've measured the exposure levels, and they exceed the standards that have been established by this authority. Then you have pollution. If you don't have that, don't get up and say they are polluting. They're the worst of polluters. No, they are not. Because that, that pollution is defined by law, whether you like it or not. Now go and establish that law. How do they become exempt from the EPA? You get, you have to deal with the, the deciding officials at the federal, state, and local level. These things change even. It's a separate world. Just to say, well, they pollute. They, in fact, under the law, they are not polluting. No, if you want to drink, don't claim it unless you can back it up by statute. DES is to the FAA. Now you told them to go to a lawyer yes. without any basis of going to a lawyer with. To sue the FAA. And make On what basis? To get the Breaking the law that you don't have? Gentlemen, please. <laughs> this is not the other thing about bringing the lawyers. Now, the railroads, the richest suburbs, went to to get at the um, uh, Barrington there and all that to keep the, the Canadian national. But they didn't have any success on that. So you don't even got to think twice about going down that legal route. That they didn't have any success at all, and they had a lot of them. They had the five hundred thousand dollars. Why are they exempt? Why is they And the, they didn't defeat the railroads. The laws are, are, that's what I mean. You have to do your research into the statute, come in. I just can't claim, I can't file a grievance that they're imagined, oh, well, they're, they're, there's imaginary substances hurting my employees. This isn't imaginary, it's the worst polluter in Chicago. You, by law, it is not. It is not. You can't enforce a non existent law. What can I tell you? That's what I mean. Just blah, 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 you know, does to do it. Now, the other thing about trains taking over, not taking over. it's not going to be easy to do. Of course not. <clears throat> but we're On December 16th, yeah. the most recent funding for transportation was advanced in Congress. Um, there barely was enough money to keep the current little tiny Amtrak system in operation and zero money for high speed rail. Of course they want to um, the, the let's face it, um, O'Hare is a hub, nation worldwide hub. It's called integrated transportation where people transfer. Yeah, as to having an alternative to that, but it doesn't seem to be the policy of the United States right now to offer an alternative to the airlines. That's another thing to consider. So, yeah, it is an option if you could say, well, if we could get people out of airplanes. However, right now, 
it's not a realistic one, and it would be years away from this, unfortunately. That that's the decision making. I'm ready. Uh, people on this, but anyhow, that's just a few things on transportation. Um, the thing like here, this letter. I mean, it, it, that's good that you're bringing that's you're good in bringing the issue to the front of people pursuing an election. It's obvious this letter doesn't mean anything. I mean, they could change their mind, whatever. But you created an issue. That's cool. You brought the issue up, and if people don't, the squeaky wheel type logic, that's really cool. I've been trying to do that with public transit. We've sent questionnaires. We don't even care if they get filled out. I understand. I understand. <laughs> but we're getting every candidate picks up a piece of paper with our issue, whether or not they take our side on it or not. But that's cool. You got it in the forefront. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. You got to decide. Um, it's got its own little world that defines who, who, who decides what happens and who not. Uh, certainly, this is a, a major, major. We're talking money here, yes, and you, you're up against as big a players as you're going to find on this. This is big bucks. Airline industry is not small change. I'm, I'm familiar a little bit about what those airlines that's in other airports um, where they they come in and those things. As a matter of fact, I won't get into it, a number of my colleagues were air traffic controllers who were fired and our union took them in. So that I've heard many stories of the airlines here. But anyway, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. You don't know anything. Thank you, Charles. No? I'm going to have to give you, yeah. to get, get a notepad and I'll give you a class. <laughs> okay. All right, Professor. Oh, one last thing. <laughs> no, Just one thing. Fine. The guy that was here years ago told us that an airline, one airplane pollutes as much pollution as all the leaves of grass on earth. <clears throat> Particulate matter yeah. comes out of one yes. airplane. Wow. They burn 50,000 gallons of gas per flight. So. Five to fifty thousand gallons per flight. Our buddy Jack. Yeah. Yeah, we had a really good entire go to right. Rico.org. Mike, enough. This is my subject matter. <laughs> this is my David. <laughs> Speak up. Hi, I'm John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> And you know, when they were giving me that lethal injection, I had to stand up to a lot of heat. And I stayed dry with new arid extra dry. And you should too. And... In the future, I'll give you the benefit of my mind when I don't get heckled by Charlie. <laughs> What'd you do, Charlie? I don't know. Well, no more? We can go now. This fellas? The stars you get like, to Rico.org. I did, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. Well, actually, oh, you're a whole organization. You're on. Good, these are final comments. Yay. Yeah. I, I actually see final Rico. Comments. Yeah. You should have this guy speak with your group someday. He's excellent. So I'll give you my card just at the end because I, I, I heard them. Do you want to say something? Go John Luke's been waiting. Oh, All his son has been waiting. He, he likes pulling strings. Wait a minute. Come, Come on. on. Can I answer his question? The difference point? between a, that energy is that the power for a train, like a bullet train, is in one place. Like an airplane that has an end to power on each vehicle. If you have the power in one place, you can control it, make it clean, and like he's saying. But if it's on the vehicle, uh, yeah. All right, well, I appreciate all your comments. Thank you very much. And I know this will be the last time I'm up here, so let me just say again thank you to the College of Complexes for inviting the Fair Coalition uh, and me here today. Uh, thank you to Susan, who probably his name doesn't get mentioned often on air, but maybe it does. Thank you, great hostess, uh, great thank recommendations you. on the food. Uh, and great food here at the Hilltop Restaurant. So since this is going out on video, right, always plug your sponsors. Thank so you. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Let me just do a few quick items that I heard, and again, thank you. I took some notes on things you said. I think you've had some good ideas, and I want to acknowledge that and say thank you. Um, yes, but, uh, Charlie, right. I understand that construction that when you, as soon as you use the word but, it says this, this regard and dismiss everything prior to the word but. I get that now. I didn't know what you were asking me earlier. Um, so the yes but, though, is that, again, I go back to we live in a democracy, and therefore the conditions that we demand as people are ones that are the most relevant. And that is no small thing for us not to forget that as American citizens or anybody who's privileged enough to live in a democracy, that the but part when we are talking about things that are going on in our society, which is us, right, we the people, uh, actually is real and does matter. Okay, uh, we've had planes for years. Uh, there's an airport around. I heard a uh, few of you say that. Of course, we know that. Uh, but the reality is, as the world changes, we get to have further say in it. It's not fixed. The airports are not fixed. The world around it is not fixed. Therefore, things change. When I was a kid, there used to be a thing called the Chicago Stadium. It's no longer there. There's now United Center. Things change. Midway Airport didn't used to exist. Things change. O'Hare has expanded. Things change. So the argument of we've had planes for years is one that we just say, well, by that token, that nothing can ever change. But we know that that's not true. Jet pause. Uh, we heard that in conversations, when you're talking, you live underneath the flight path, here's what you have to do. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. That's called jet pause. There's an actual term for it. Where you have a high frequency of planes that interrupt conversations to the point that you cannot hear each other, and therefore you have to pause. God bless you. Thank you. Someone mentioned the uh, uh, corruption uh, in the daily administration, which uh, went hand in hand uh, at times with the build out the O'Hare modernization plan under Mayor Daly. I would refer you to the fairchicago.org website. We have the Bruner Report, which is a 153 page PDF document uh, about the ties of uh, Mayor Daly and the families. Uh, and the businesses, some of which are kind of just how business is done, some of which you read and you can't help but say, this sounds a little sinister. So go to our website, fairchicago.org, and read the Bruner Report. It is on there. Uh, to our high-speed rail, which got mentioned many times, huge fan of, of rail. Uh, I've taken Amtrak many times, which is not high speed. It's anything but high speed, yep. except for maybe the Acela trains out west on uh, the east coast, but even that's not high speed. But high speed rail for me, just as a citizen, as a side note, not related affair, I do hope we in America uh, take high speed rail seriously. It's a good option. I've done it in Europe, and uh, when run right, it's a really, really good way to go. Okay, just a few more things. Um, uh, oh, so I like the idea, I want to acknowledge this, I think Charlie, this is yours, uh, to push this city, city wide. I really like the way you said the city is being polluted. Yeah. I wrote that down, cool. so thank you for that suggestion. We haven't really done much on the environmental end of FAIR. We've done it more on messaging on democracy, on the impact, on the changes not being done without us and, and not having that mechanism. But I like that, Charlie, so I want to say thank you and acknowledge that. Um, and then two final things in closing. There is, in our society, in America, we know that we say we are a nation under rule of law. Uh, but I have to tell you this, that the days uh, when, in America, we put law over the changing needs and demands uh, that the people demand and have, it will be a sad day in our nation. Many of our laws have changed over time. So rule of law means that we comport ourselves in such a way that says we acknowledge them but I hope we never reach the point in this country where the laws, which can be established by people who may not represent the people, right? I mean, they are influenced heavily, our elected officials, heavily by many of the vested interests that were mentioned tonight. The day that those laws become more important than the people and our citizens will be a very sad day in America. And I will work to ensure that that never happens because that is not appropriate. So I respect the rule of law, and yet we, the people, are the ones who make those laws, have to live underneath them, and we should overthrow any laws that are not working for us uh, when those laws come up. And by overthrow, I just mean dismiss. Okay, in closing, all good speakers invite action. Go to fairchicago.org, join the FAIR Coalition. You can, in joining, then talk to your neighbors, tell them about FAIR, you can put up a yard sign, uh, through FAIR, you can complain, make noise complaints. You can join one of our teams. We have a variety of teams that do all sorts of work. Um, and you can meet with your elected officials as part of FAIR. You can go to civic meetings. You can go to the College of Complexes and speak. You can educate each other and you can act. 
So I invite you again to go to fairchicago.org, mm -hmm. and on there you'll see a really, really cool video called Highway Over Our Heads, done by some of our members, and I invite you to uh, go there and look at it. It's a fun little song that uh, if you've done kind of any community, or community building uh, or anything where you need a theme song, it's there, and it's a lot of fun, and I think Tim's going to put it on the video that shows. So thank you for having FAIR. Go act as a citizen. Live out our democracy by talking to your neighbors, joining FAIR, put up a yard sign, and get involved. So I think I'm due to say thank you now. Is that right? I'm done then. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your ideas. Very informal. Tomorrow I'll be